Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Three Keys success to Successful Execution webinar. Denise Harrison, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Simplified Strategic Planning, Inc., will be presenting her findings based on working with hundreds of companies on strategic planning and strategic execution. Denise brings a wealth of hands-on experience to this subject. Prior to working for the Center for Simplified Strategic Planning, Denise worked for a Fortune 500 company holding a variety of positions, including president of one of their divisions, and then moved to the president of a financial services firm. Denise, before we start the seminar, can you tell us why you find strategic planning a key element to a company's success? Thank you, Dana. So let me start with a little background. As Dana mentioned, I work for a Fortune 500 company, and you know strategic planning is a rite of passage every year for any uh, Fortune 500 company. So every year we would get up in front of the senior management team and present our strategy. And this was an important part of our process because if you did a good job, you would collect $200 and immediately pass go. But if you did a bad job, you would go directly to jail. And after these presentations, we would become mired in our budgeting process. And of course, because we were a publicly held company, we would be trying to make our year-end numbers. So what happened to the strategy? Well, in fact, it would go back up on the shelf and it would gather dust until the next cycle, the next year's strategic planning presentation. Then we dust it off, freshen it up, and present again. Well, during this time working for the Fortune 500 company, I received a phone call. And I was asked if I would be interested in running a small financial services firm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Well, when I interviewed for the position, I saw there was a trickle of red ink. Well, they weren't bringing a new president in because things were good. So I took the job, and by the time I actually started the position, that small trickle of red ink had turned into a waterfall, and I was going to have to turn this company around fast. So I spoke to each one of my direct reports, and each one of them knew exactly how to save the company. But each one had a different idea. And I didn't come in here under knowing the industry and with a playbook of exactly what I needed to do. So I had to get the team on the same page and we, as a team, had to select the projects we needed to work on so that we would enable the company to turn around. That's when I found strategic planning was important. It was important to hear everyone's best thinking, to get ideas from the marketing sales point, sales point of view, the customer's point of view, understanding the operational issues, and understanding the new opportunities that might present greater revenue and greater profitability. But with everyone sharing their ideas and understanding what our choices were, we then had to select the few strategic initiatives to work on to turn this company around. Because of our financial straits, we had limited resources to actually work on this and turn the company around. Well, there's a happy ending to the story. We were focused, we selected good st strategic initiatives, and the company turned around. As a matter of fact, in the second year, we made more profit than we had if you accumulated the profit during the whole life of the company. Additionally, as we moved four years out, we grew the company by 150%. That's where I learned how critical strategic planning and strategic execution is to a company's success. But if execution is so important, why do so many people have problems failing to execute? Failing to execute. So you develop a great strategic plan, and you're all ready to take your company from good to great, but you find you're only going from great to mediocre. That great strategic plan, when you look at it 12 months later, you've just made limited progress in positioning your company for future success. What happened? Well, often the urgent, the day-to-day, -day gets in the way of the important, the long range projects that position you for future success. So today we'll be talking about the three most prominent causes of execution train wrecks and how to avoid them. 
So this is based on the data of looking at hundreds of different companies and what's really caused uh, people not to execute successfully. So let me give you some data. First, if you develop a strategic plan, that's key to strategic execution because you have to know what you want to do. But if you stop when you develop the strategic plan and you don't move it further, you're only going to achieve 30 to 40 percent of what you want to accomplish. But if you take that strategic plan, and that's your three to five year vision of what you, where your company needs to go, and you select the six to ten key strategic initiatives and develop action plans or clear roadmaps of where you want to go, you'll achieve 70 percent of what you want to accomplish. If you then take those action plans and monitor your developments and progress on a monthly basis, you'll achieve 90 percent of your strategic plan. So you can't just stop with plan development. You need a great plan, but in order to execute, you need clear roadmaps and a monitoring system. So let's do a deep dive on monitoring. Monitoring is the third most important step. So when I say monitoring, what do I mean? Well, I mean monthly meetings that make sure that all of your strategic initiatives are on track. So why do you do this? I mean, you've got plenty of meetings. Why do you need another meeting? Well, first of all, this forces the team to be on track because they have to report on their strategic initiatives. And this keeps the long-term projects uh, on, at top of mind so that you don't lose track of them due to the day-to-day -day, uh, routine activities that allow your business to keep running. The second reason is it allows you to make changes in your strategic plan due to changes in market conditions. And let me give you an example. I was working with a remote video inspection company. Now, remote video inspection, what's that? That's when, let's say you're a municipality and you have some problems with your sewers. You send a probe down to look and see if it's weeds or something else that's clogging it up so you can decide how to best get rid of uh, the problem that's causing the backup. Well, that's remote video inspection equipment. Or let's say you have an airplane that's flown through a flock of birds and you want to check out the engine and make sure it's okay to keep the plane in service. Will you once again send in a probe to see if the engine's okay? That's remote video inspection. Or let's say you're working at a nuclear plant and you want to see if there are any weak areas in your containment vessels. Once again, you send in a probe and this allows you to see if there are any weak areas. That's remote video inspection. So working with this team in August of 2001, we decided that one of the key segments that we wanted to focus on was the commercial airline industry. The industry was booming and the commercial airlines were keeping their planes in service for much longer and that meant they had to do more frequent engine inspections to make sure the planes were stay, safe to keep in service. We saw this as being a great market, a growing market, and our equipment was uniquely suited to meet the commercial aircraft needs in that it was very easy to stand on a ladder and use our equipment to go and look in the engine. It had a good human machine interface. So we walked out of the meeting. We had a great action plan. We were going to gain significant market share in this growing and lucrative market. But September, and what happened in September of 2001? Well, you know, planes flew into the World Trade Center. They flew into the Pentagon. They crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. And all of a sudden, that commercial airline industry was no longer a growth industry. As a matter of fact, all the commercial airline companies pulled back because people weren't flying anymore. And the industry that I ha we had identified as a growth industry was in turmoil. Well, did that mean we should keep this was our strategy. Should, should we keep our focus on that industry, even though now it was in turmoil? Well, of course not. So in our monthly monitoring meeting, we, of course, identified the turmoil, and we said, now, yeah, where could we expend those resources we had formerly allocated to the commercial airline industry? 
And well, you guessed it, it was the military area. Because yes, we were going to retaliate as a nation. And we were going to have much, many more missions. And these missions were going to be flown in desert conditions. And sand and aircraft engines are not exactly friends. So they were going to need this remote video inspection equipment to inspect the planes before they went out on other um, missions and all the uh, helicopters also. So this is how you allow your strategy to be dynamic and the monitoring meetings allow you to make course corrections when business conditions change. Now another reason for monitoring is for you to make changes when there's new information. So maybe the whole market condition doesn't change. As a matter of fact it might even stay the same but you have new information. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say you're developing a new product and you're moving along with your product development and you take your prototype out to the marketplace and you find that the market doesn't like it. And the example I'd like to use is the market demanded global communication. So think of a cell phone that you could talk anywhere in the world and there was a high market demand for that. However, when the first prototype came out with global capabilities, it weighed five pounds. Now, while the demand, there was no change in market condition, there clearly was still demand for the need to be able to have a communication device that allowed you to talk or phone home or phone uh, from anywhere in the world. But at five pounds, it wasn't really a popular device. So, Rather than continue forward with this action plan, there had to be a period of time that elapsed where the technology caught up in it and it allowed for a much lighter device. So the monitoring program is when you are presenting and you're talking about your progress on action plans and if you have new information that says this action plan really shouldn't move forward, this is where you agree as a team that you're going to put this action plan on hold and it allows you to reallocate resources to the existing action plans or consider a new one so you can get uh, new growth in a new area. So that's what monitoring is and why you do it. Now let's talk about some of the pitfalls that we see. First, frequency of meetings. Well, we all have too many meetings. And there's a desire to have your monitoring meetings on a quarter, quarterly basis. But we find, after looking at many companies, that this really is not successful. It's much more successful to have the meetings monthly. Because if you're like me, and I'm deadline oriented, before our monthly monitoring meeting, the week before, I'm quickly trying to make sure everything that needs to be done on my action plan is done so I can present it as being on track in our meeting. And it's much easier to, to uh, catch up for the month on a monthly basis, but if you're trying to do it quarterly and you're trying to catch up on three months worth of work, it's kind of hard. And if you can't, it's even more difficult to catch up as you move forward. So rather than getting three months behind, the monthly meetings allow people to stay on track. And if there is a problem, it allows people to have discussions about how you can catch up, but it's within a month rather than within a quarter. Next. Action plans need to be updated before the meeting. So your team leaders are responsible for knowing exactly where the action plan is and making that presentation. If folks are not prepared in the meeting, it takes much longer. So in order to make these meetings efficient, the action plans have to be updated and the team leaders need to present what happened in the last month and what they're planning to do in the next month and get everything scheduled. And that can be a three to five minute discussion. So these meetings can be fairly short if people are prepared and everybody is on target. The next problem we see is that if an action plan is not on track, that people are good at assessing blame rather than solving problems. So the goal of having your senior management team in a monitoring meeting is to discuss how we can get things back on track. And let me give you an example. One of team I was working with, there was one step and it was behind schedule. And the person responsible for that step was doing heavy international travel. Well, 
We could just blame the person and say, hey, get this step on track. Or we could say, you're doing heavy international travel. It's going to be another two months for you to get this done. That's fine. We'll just wait another two months. Or we could, as a senior management team, say, hey, you're busy. We get it. Are there any other resources we can reallocate to solve this problem? In our, in our, in our instance, someone volunteered to do, do all the research that was necessary to move this step forward. And the research, once it was done, then the person, when he came back in from his international travels, he could easily make the phone calls required. But the research coming up to the phone calls was done, so he could move, the, move it forward much more quickly because uh, someone else had stepped up to the plate. So when action plans are off track, use your monitoring meeting as a problem-solving meeting to figure out how, as a team, you can get this action plan back on track. Now that said, there's a desire for many teams to make their meetings more efficient by, to review the action plans by exception. So, for example, let's say we had eight action plans and five of them were on track. We would just review the three that were not on track and therefore save time. Well, yes, you do need to do a deep dive on the ones that aren't on track to talk about how you can get them back on track. But if you don't review all the action plans, then you lose a com an important communication opportunity. And here's what can happen. So a product development action plan was on track, and this team was reviewing by exception. So it was on track, it was on track, it was on track, and the product was released on time and under budget. So you'd think it'd be successful. Well, in fact, here's what happened. When the product was released, we found that an action step had been missing. The action step that, re, that was, uh, would require registration in different countries. So the rollout went much more slowly because we had to take a step back and wait for the registration process to be complete before we actually had a complete international rollout. If, instead of reviewing action plans by exception, we had each person review their action plan, then this product development plan would have been reviewed and they would have talked about this is what we said we were going to do last month, this is what we're going to do this month, and the international person on the senior management team would have said, hey, wait a minute, I think we've left out a step, and that step is the international registration. And that's why this communication is important, because while your action plans can be really good, there's always a possibility that you've left out a step. And by communicating on a monthly basis your pro progress, you give the rest of the senior management team a chance to give you some input in case something's been left out or in case something new has come up that you need to consider. So it's important to review all your action plans, albeit the ones that are on track will be a, a, much, um, a very quick overview. Now, we've already discussed the importance of monitoring when business conditions change or there's a change in information which causes there to be a change in product relevance. This enables your strategic planning process to be dynamic so you don't end up with a strategic plan that's cast in stone and you're able to make adjustments and monitoring is perfect for that. The next problem we often see is that new projects and opportunities come up during the year. And as I said, monitoring allows your strategic plan to be dynamic. How do you add projects? Well, what you do is you present the project to the rest of the team as a new opportunity. If the team thinks it's a great opportunity, you can add this project to your list. But by adding one to the list, you need to take one away so you can reallocate uh, resources to get this new project moving forward. If you forget this last step, it means that you keep adding pro projects and assuming that you have resources that will be able to take on more projects, and this will cause all of your projects to slow down. So while it's important to have that capability to add projects, when you're thinking about adding projects, be sure you take one away. 
If you find that the strategic initiatives you're currently working on are too important, then save this project until you've completed one of your initiatives or until next year's strategic planning cycle. Now, the final pitfall in monitoring that we see is we sometimes see people declare victory before the initiative is really accomplished. So an example would be we're going to release a new product that will give us $2 million of profitable revenue by February of 2014. And you actually release the product, it's on time, and you declare victory that this action plans a success. But hey, wait a minute. We have achieved the $2 million of profitable revenue. Just because we released a product, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to achieve that target. So rather than looking at victory, you now need to be looking at, is there anything that's keeping you from attaining that $2 million of profitable revenue? Do you need to retrain the sales force? Because the early training, now that the product's in the market, the sales team has new questions about the product, so it's time for a retraining effort. Or perhaps you're not meeting your profitability targets, and you need a process redesign in your operational area to make the actual production process more efficient so you meet your profitability targets. Or let's say you release the product and you find that there are new end uses. Maybe you can update your brochure or add some one sheets and this will enable to meet your target. So it's important when you have a strategic initiative that you don't declare victory before that initiative is truly accomplished. So we've talked of a number of pitfalls. Let's give you a checklist. First, we said have regular monthly meetings. Make sure your team leaders are prepared. Identify problems, but develop solutions rather than assess blame. Your monitoring meeting is where you have a chance to change your strategy when business conditions change or there's new information. It's important to walk out of this monitoring meeting with a clear picture of what's going to be accomplished in the next month before the next meeting. So, a key takeaway from monitoring is that monitoring ensures that you will not lose focus on the strategic initiatives that will focus you for future success. Don't leave this to chance. Great point, Denise. Sounds like monitoring keeps the strategy in front of the team and always allows the process to be dynamic. Thanks, Dana. So that was the third most important. Let's move to the second most important. And this is developing clear roadmaps or action plans for those strategic initiatives that you want to move forward in the next 12 to 18 months. What does this mean? Well, first, your strategic initiative needs to be a clear statement of intended results for each strategic initiative. So they need to be specific. It, you need to know exactly what you're going to do so you know it when you see it. They need to be measurable, so there needs to be some quantification. It needs to be attainable. We believe in six-inch stretch, but don't try for the six-mile stretch. They need to be relevant and tie back to the strategy, and they need to be time-bounded. So earlier, we were talking about a strategic initiative, and that was to develop this product that would generate $2 million of profitable revenue by February of 2014. It's specific, it's measurable, $2 million of profitable re uh, revenue, it's attainable, it's relevant, it ties back to some of our growth strategies, and it's time-bounded. You know that it should be done by February 2014. So you need that clear statement of intended results. From that, you need to then develop detailed action plans or clear roadmaps for each one of these strategic initiatives. Why? This clarify what, clarifies what needs to happen in order to achieve that strategic initiative, and it focuses on the result. It defines what resourcing is necessary so you know how to allocate your resources. How do you do this? 
First, you have to identify a team leader or a project champion. This is the person who has fire in their belly and really wants to get this accomplished. But you can't just leave it in one person's purview. You need to identify the team. These are the folks who will be important to helping achieve this particular strategic initiative. And you need a team because as you define that action plan, the detailed action steps in order to achieve this, you, the team allows that to be much more robust than if you just have one person do it. Now let's talk about the action plans. You need granular action steps defining who's responsible for how much each step, how much time, and how much money each step will take. And this, allow, understanding what each step will be and who's responsible and how much time and money will allow you to understand how much time is required for strategic initiatives and you need to balance that against what's required to get that done, uh, what's required in the day-to-day -day work that everybody has. Because you can't just work on day-to-day -day things because then you're not positioned for the future. But if you only work on strategic initiatives, then you're not doing the day-to-day -day work. And that's what's needed to do uh, generate the revenue that you need to do currently. So you need to take both into account. Pitfalls. Developing the action plan in a vacuum. Well, if you do that, then your action, the people who are actually going to help you get this strategic initiative and accomplishment and accomplish this strategic initiative, if you do it in a vacuum, then they're going to feel like you've done it to them. And then all of a sudden, they're being pulled from their day-to-day -day work, and they don't really understand how they fit into the picture. If you invite them and allow them to understand why this strategic initiative is important, and you get their best thinking of how to accomplish it, you'll get a lot more buy-in, and they will tell you the amount of time things will take, and you, you'll find that they won't feel like you're doing something to them, taking them away from their day-to-day -day job. Next, action steps are not granular enough, or the, the full scope of the project is not comprehended. And let me give you an example of this, and I see this uh, a lot. It's, um, an ERP system action plan, an IT uh, person was presenting this action plan, and it was a 10-step action plan, and he said, we'll install this ERP system in the space of three months. And I've got lots of background. I've done this before. It'll be no problem. And the team questioned, well, do you really have buy-in from everybody who needs to be involved because of everybody across the company needed to be involved? And really, these steps, they're not granular enough. Have you thought this through? And he said, yes, yes, I've got a whole Microsoft project plan behind it where there are a 1,000 hours of work, and we'll get this done. It'll be no problem. Well, sure enough, three months elapsed, and nothing really happened. And once again, the team asked, are you sure you've got the buy-in? Because we're not really sure what you were supposed to be doing here. And once again, he said, oh, yes, there's all the detailed steps. I'm just working with people below you because they're closer to the actual business. Three months later, still no progress. Well, you know what happened. The CEO had to take in and wrest control of this action plan and move the action plan meetings to a weekly basis so that we hammered out each step and who was responsible. And then we had to make progress as a team. It was extremely painful for all involved. And sure enough, the ERP system, nah, it wasn't going to take three months. It was going to take about 18 months. And the unfortunate thing was we had lost six months in progress because the action plan was not granular enough. We didn't know how much time it was really going to take. And we really didn't take it the take a look at the full scope of the project. So it's important that we really understand the details at this point. And this is where the strategy turns into action and the tactics are very, very important. And then finally, you need to balance your tactical job requirements with strategic initiatives. And you're going to find that there's some overloads. But what do you do with the overloads? Do you just assume that people will work twice as hard so they can do what's required day-to-day -day in their strategic initiatives. 
Or do you assume that you're going to be able to clone your star performers? Or do you assume their evil twin will show up and pitch in and actually get the work done? Well, you know that's not going to work. So you need to resolve the overload by looking at who's overloaded and seeing if we can delegate any of their day-to-day -day job requirements or their strategic initiatives. Or to see if we can eliminate anything that they're doing on either front. Or are there any steps that we can actually reduce the scope and still get the job done? But do this. Don't assume that people's time expand to meet your strategic initiative needs. That makes for very unhappy people, and it's going to slow your project projects um, down by a lot. So try to get these overloads resolved before you actually get into your, strate uh, your strategic initiatives and moving them forward. So here's a checklist. Do you have a champion? Who is on the action plan team? Do you have the right people on the team who are going to actually help you implement it? Are the action steps clear? Do you know what is going to happen in each step? Is there clear accountability for each step? So if a step is not on track, do you know who to call and find out where you are and what the problem is? Are the time requirements understood? And those are twofold. So let's say a particular action step is going to take 10 hours. Well, that's good. Do you assume that's going to happen in a day? Or, in fact, those 10 hours, are some going to happen the third week in September? Some the fourth week in September? Some actually in the second week of October? And then the rest won't get completed till the end of October? So it may only take 10 hours, but those 10 hours may actually occur over two months. Do you understand the financial requirements, and do we have enough financial resources? This is very important, because if you don't have the financial resources to move a, an action plan forward, then stop it. Don't let people get frustrated by developing half of an action plan and then telling them, well, we, we can't move this forward because we don't have enough money. Have we balanced those day-to-day -day resource requirements with the action plan requirements? And if we accomplish this action plan, will we achieve this strategic initiative? So at the end of every action plan, you need to feel that you'll accomplish what it is you're setting out to do. So the key takeaway in this area, clear roadmaps, is you need action plans that provide this roadmap that talk about what's going to happen, who's responsible, how much time, and how much money. And this will turn your strategy into action. Yes, Denise, this can be where teams run into trouble. I've seen many instances where people get very enthusiastic with the result that they overcommit. Everyone needs to strike a balance between their day-to-day -day jobs and their action plan commitments. Reality has to govern. Thanks, Dana. So we just covered action planning, and that's the second most important step. Now let's go to number one. So what you all were waiting for. That's focusing on the few, and this is far and away where I see most teams have their biggest problems, and it's selecting the few strategic initiatives to work on. Why? Because if you have too many strategic initiatives, then there's little progress that's made on a lot of initiatives rather than substantial progress that's made on a few. And when you try to take on too much, people feel very unsuccessful and you feel like you never get anything done. So how do you do this? Well, as part of your strategic planning process, you should be sorting out the priorities. So you need to be thinking about which business segments will get the most focus and have the highest return. Um, and, but so you're not focusing on all business segments, and this is an area many teams struggle with. Additionally, what key opportunities will we focus on? So during strategic planning, you may come up with as many as 40 or 50 new opportunities, but you need to constantly be working on, with them on a funnel so you're slowly getting them down to what are the 10 we think are best. 
and then saying, even though all of these ten look good, what are the two or three we think are best? And what are the internal priorities we need to focus on? Let me give you an example. I'm going to go back to the remote video inspection equipment. And when I first started working with them, they were a pretty small company. They were under $10 million. And their CEO, we had, oh, maybe 17 different market segments. And he wanted to grow in all the market segments. And I said, wait, most of my companies, if they um, focus on a few, then they'll really make a lot of progress in those few. And um, that makes them much more successful. But he couldn't let it go. He wouldn't decide which business segments were most important. He wanted to grow in all 17. And imagine that in a company that's less than $10 million. Well, of course, the next time we did strategic planning, we hadn't grown any, we really hadn't grown at all. And people were frustrated because we really weren't making any headway. We still had low market share in all of our market segments. But once again, when it came to select the few business segments, he just couldn't let go. And he wanted to try to grow everywhere instead of defining which ones we had the most chance of really growing market share and gaining profitability. Well, the next time we did strategic planning, that CEO wasn't there anymore. And the holding company removed him from his position because he just hadn't been able to focus. And we brought in a new CEO. And once again, there was a struggle to really focus on business segments. And he struggled with it. No, okay, he was able to narrow it down to about eight. But once again, the next year, we still hadn't made a lot of progress. And he said, Denise, look, you said you've worked with lots of different companies and focus is paramount. We're going to do this this next year. We're going to pick those three or four segments we're going to focus on, and we're going to really try and move the ball and see if this focus works. Well, lo and behold, it did. And over the course of the next three or four years, this company grew from $10 million to $70 million. And in the segments that they chose to dominate, they were competing against GE. GE had decided that Non-invasive testing, which remote video inspection was a segment of, was one of the areas that uh, for their future growth. But they decided that rather than going head-to-head -head with this small company, that they would purchase them. Because as the dominant player in the marketplace, it was easier to buy them than to gain market share by competing head-to-head. -head. Well, that's the power of focus. So your strategic planning process should help you sort out priorities. Because the easy part of strategic planning is saying yes. The hard part is saying no. So in addition, once you have your strategy developed and you understand where you want to go for your next three to five years, yes, now you need to boil it down to those strategic initiatives, the things you want to do for the next 12 to 18 months. There should be no more than 10. Yep, even when we work with large companies like ExxonMobil and Seagate, we limit them to 10. And that number is even less if you've got these mega initiatives like an ERP system. Your number may go down to two or three if you've got one of these huge projects and you're a fairly small company. So what are the pitfalls? The, we have to do this, and this goes hand in glove with the ability to say no. Um, it's not unusual, and I see this all the time, uh, that people, um, we develop our, let's say we chose eight strategic initiatives, and then all of a sudden someone raises their hand, oh, but we have to do this, we promised this to this customer. Or if we don't finish this product rollout and come out with a new version, we're not going to be able to gain market share. And oh, we forgot this internal development, if we don't install um, and our uh, customer requirements management system, then we're not going to understand where our customers are. And all of a sudden, our eight strategic initiatives turn into 15. Well, let me tell you, I understand that there are some things you have to do. But if there are, then you need to put them on the list. But that means some other things come off the list. So don't get pulled into the, ha we have to do this and let your list grow over 10. Keep that list short, and if you really have to do some of these other things, 
then they become strategic initiatives and some of the other things that you'd like to do, you're going to have to pull off the list until you have accomplished some of these we have to do things. And this one, as I mentioned, goes hand in glove with abilities to say no. And this is the hardest thing for most strategic planning teams to, to do. Because what you're saying no to doesn't mean that these are bad ideas. Often, these are very good ideas. They're just not as good as the ones we've selected. So you need a strategic planning process that allows your team to research your markets so that when you make these decisions, you're making them as fact-based decisions and allows you to research your opportunities in depth so you're not making top-of-mind decisions based on the customer you saw last week. You need to understand what that opportunity looks like, how big it can be, who the competitors are, what are the growth rates. So when you get to strategic planning with the research done, you're then able to make better decisions. That said, you also need a process that has an analysis function that allows you to understand the importance relative to the choices. So you, many processes just look at each idea discreetly, but it's important to look at all your choices and pick the few that are right for you. Let me take a, um, a little comment from Steve Jobs on strategy. He struggled with this too. Strategy. It comes from saying no to a thousand things that will cause you to go off track or cause you to do too much. So even Steve Jobs had to wrestle with this. And as you know, he's very successful in the innovation space. But as he said, he's had to say no to a thousand things so that he didn't get on the wrong track or try to do too much. So focus on the few, the checklist. Are you focused on the few strategic initiatives that will truly help you achieve your strategy? Have you selected strategic initiatives and is your selection balanced? So when I work with a team that's very customer focused, we all of a sudden have all our strategic initiatives and they're all about new products and new markets. Or if I work with a very operational team, they're all about fixing the infrastructure and streamlining and making things more efficient. You have to look at your list and make sure you've got some where you're working on your core businesses and growing them. Looking at new growth opportunities with some of your other strategic initiatives. And then, are you doing your internal infrastructure areas so that you are focused on what you need to do in order to be positioned for growth and you have that infrastructure in place. So make sure your initiatives are balanced. You of course know by now that you might have too many strategic initiatives, so that's the, you know, the ability to say no. And make sure your strategic initiatives link, link back to your strategy, your goals, and your mission. You want to be able to say, if we accomplish these strategic initiatives, our company will be in a better place and will move significantly closer to achieving our strategic direction. And if you can answer that, then the next thing you need to be sure you do is communicate these initiatives throughout your organization. If your senior management teams know the key projects we're focused on for the next 12 to 18 months, it's important to tell the rest of the organization so they don't get bogged down in projects that are not the ones that we've chosen to move forward. It'll help you with your resource allocation. So we've covered a great deal today. Execution is the key part of strategic success. So we talked about if all you do is develop your strategy, you're only going to achieve 30 or 40% of what you set out to accomplish. Execution, turning that strategy into action, enables you to achieve 90 to 100 percent. And here are the three reasons why that will help you keep your execution on track. Monitoring. This monthly monitoring of process allows you to stay on track and make course corrections when business conditions change. Having clear roadmaps or action plans for those strategic, strategic uh, initiatives that you've chosen to pursue. 
knowing who's responsible so you have accountability, how much time it will take, how much money, so you know how much maybe resources need to be allocated and when each step will happen and when the plan will be done. And finally, focus on the few. This is the most important area and this is where I find many teams go off track. You need a strategic plan that allows you to focus on top priorities by having research that allows you to understand the relative benefits of your markets, your opportunities, and your internal development. You need balanced decision making. You need all the people on your team to understand the research and then you get decision making from the people with customer view, viewpoints, the operational team, the financial and admin team. And then at the end of the day, you do need to make choices. And often what you say no to, they're very good ideas and good things to do, just not as good as the things you've selected. And that allows you to select on those few strategic initiatives to work on. Now, we've covered many things about execution, um, monitoring clear roadmaps and focusing on the few, but if you think your strategic planning process is not setting you up to make good decisions around selecting these initiatives, because you may not have a consistent approach, so when you look at your markets, you don't look at them in a consistent manner, or look at your I, um, your opportunities. You don't look at the same set of things for each op opportunities. Or you just have a strategic plan where you don't have research and you just do top of mind thinking. Or you lack an analysis function. I'd like to offer those of you who are listening to this webinar today a benefit uh, to attend our Simplified Strategic Planning Workshop, which talks about how you do each one of these steps how you do the research, how you have an analysis function, and how you make decisions. This is a two-day workshop, and for those of you who've listened to this webinar, we'd like to offer that for $9.95. Now, regularly, it's priced at $18.95, so this is a great value. And people who take this two-day seminar really get their strategic planning back on track. They walk out with great new ideas on how, you, how to stimulate strategic thinking. So here's the website. And for those of you who are listening to an archived version of this presentation, please call Elizabeth Kidd, and she can help you take advantage of this offer. Now, addition, in addition to our strategic planning seminars, we have in-house workshops so we can tailor something to meet your company's specific needs. And for those of you who'd like to walk through strategic planning, we provide full process consulting where we work on the process, you develop your strategy, and what's great for you is you're focused on strategic thinking and you don't have to be involved in the process. We have the process that allows your team to think strategically and develop a great strategic plan. Okay, what I'd like to do now, we've covered a lot of information. Um, do you have any questions? Dana, do you see any questions? Um, has anybody typed in any questions? Great job, Denise. Yes, uh, we've received a number of questions. First one is, uh, how many people should be on Action Planning Team? Well, we suggest um, generally about three to five. Uh, that's so you get good input, but the plan's not too large. Now, there are exceptions, so when you're doing something that's enterprise-wide, like a ERP system, often the action plan teams grows in more number than that. But in general, I'd recommend about three to five people. Thank you. Second, um, Sounds like a monitoring meeting can take a long time each month. Uh, can this be a problem? Absolutely, but that's where you need to manage the monitoring meeting. If you have your action plan team leaders update their action plans before the meeting and then simply ask each team leader what they accomplished the previous month, what they're going to do the next month, then each action plan team leader should only take three to five minutes. The exceptions will be when people are off track, then you do need to take a little bit of time um, discussing how you can get things back on track. But if people are prepared, 
your monitoring meetings should take no more than an hour every month. Thank you. Another one, um, what happens when people cannot attend? Well, in our meeting, if someone, um, we require all of our consultants to attend our monitoring meeting because this is important to making sure people stay on track in communication. Now, that said, when, we, when I say attend our meetings, we often call in via telephone so we don't have to be on site for the meeting. And usually people can afford to call in for an hour. Now, I do have some teams where this is just not possible. So what we do is have a representative of the action plan team report on the action plan uh, for that particular meeting. So our preference is for all of the team leaders to be in the meeting, um, to hold them accountable and for communication purposes. Um, and calling in is one great way to do that. But if that's not possible, have a designated hitter um, speak up for that action plan. That's why uh, all my action plan teams have uh, uh, not only an action plan team leader, but also a backup. And that backup is responsible for uh, attending when the leader can't and filling that role. That's an excellent point. Having a team leader and then assigning that backup allows you always to have that backstop if uh, for some reason the team leader uh, can't be in that meeting. Another question sent in, can a company have too many action plans? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Um, once again, this is the key to success, and it's where I see most teams go off track is they try to take on more they can more than they can do. I would much have, rather have you work on a few action plans, finish them, and then be able to add them to, than to work on a lot and feel unsuccessful because you haven't been able to finish anything. And one final one. You mentioned balancing money. How does the CFO work with these plans during the well, that's interesting. Um, when you develop your action plans, you now have what you want to spend on key strategic initiatives. And what I've found CFOs really like about the strategic planning process is now you define the big projects the company wants to move forward. And through the budgeting process, he knows what those projects are, and then either there's enough money or not. That's very different than a lot of other budgeting processes where each department sort of puts in what they want to spend and they have their laundry list of big projects they'd like to do. Because the strategic planning process sorts out the big projects first, you don't end up with these negotiations in the budgeting process because you've already made that decision on the big projects. So now you can focus more on some of the tactical issues that need to be resolved in budgeting. Well, Dana said that was the Thank last. You, Denise. Uh, oops, Dana. Dana said that was the last question. Um, I'd like to offer if you do have questions that you'd like to talk to me af offline about um, any specific issues that you have with execution in your company. Please give me a call or email me. And Dana, do you want to sign off? I will do so. I think uh, this. Webinar has given each of the attendees uh, some good takeaways. You will receive a follow-up email uh, from Denise, uh, and in that will be a link to download the uh, Strategic Alignment book. And we ask you that you do that. It should help you with your planning and your and your getting your teams and your people all aligned, pulling your oars in the same direction in the boat, as it were. Thank you all very much for attending and. If you want to listen to this again, we will have it posted as an archive very quickly. Thank you, and uh, we're going to sign off. Goodbye.